as a catalyst for bridging, for integrating, um, for, for improving innovation growth and, and trade in sub-Saharan Africa. So here's the outline. I'll start by trying to build the context. And then we'll, we'll do a, a short diagnosis uh, and prognosis of the state of infrastructure in Africa. And then we'll ask two very important questions. Um, has infrastructure played its catalytic role uh, in Africa? And then, and, and then we'll try and find out where infrastructure is working best. In, you know, we'll look at the different regional economic communities and we'll try to identify where infrastructure is working best. So the, the idea is to, is to get a kind of flying G's leader that will provide the motivation for other regions to... And then, and then we'll talk about some issues, some important issues. What, what are the key challenges? Um, what are the methods, strategies that work? Uh, I will take, we'll, we'll have some points, some three key points we can take away. Okay, so now if, if, you, of course, if you're following recent trends, you, you'll notice that um, uh, uh, integration is becoming more important now for, for Africa because of the recent wave of protectionism and populism around the world. So it seems that the, the most strategic option is for Africa to rebalance this growth strategy through intra-regional trade. And the key to intra-regional trade is infrastructure. So our overall message is simple. It's, it's to fast track infrastructure integration to promote cross-border trade and investment and improve countries' productivity and, 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 and to raise regional output and competitiveness. That's, I mean, that's a summary of the message we, we, we are going to be talking about. Now, you agree that there's, there's an agreement that there should be regional integration until this morning when you know, we started getting questions that, you know, but why do we really have to integrate? And, and that's a very, I mean, that's a question with a lot of merit. But in spite of the fact that a lot of majority of us agree that there should be more integration, it, it's not clear exactly what this means for Sub-Saharan Africa. It's not clear exactly how we can go about this integration and the extent to which um, regional integration of infrastructure can help to improve incomes, growth, and productivity. And that is what we focus on in this, in this paper. So, but before, before we go and focus on these three main issues, we need to, um, there, there are some important distinctions we would like to clarify. Now, there's a difference between hard and soft infrastructure, and, and I believe you're aware about this. And um, so the former are, is the stock of all the fiscal amenities that, that support the society and the economy. And, and the soft infrastructure is those non-tangible mechanisms, you know, the governance mechanisms, the regulatory frameworks that, that help to integrate infrastructure. And the kind of integration we're talking about here is, is both for soft and for hard infrastructure. There's also the question of the quality and quantity of infrastructure um, to integrate. But we, we need to define what regional infrastructure integration means. And, and so if, if there's a project that involves physical, um, if, there, if there's any fiscal project or policies that have any significant cross-border effect, then you can think about that project as a regional um, project, if it has any significant cross-border effect. Now, by that definition, it means that national infrastructure um, endowments, for example, the seaport or the airport you have, even in the center of a country, is part of the regional integration pro process. And you know, this morning we had questions about which one first. Is it um, um, national interest or regional interest? And, and it seems that you know, the, the two are complementary because as you build infrastructure at the national level, um, that's, that's the building block for integrating regional infrastructure. So the, the large portion of national infrastructure is considered to be the building block for regional infrastructure. So, so what's the problem? Now, if, if you look at, um, I mean, senior network members like Benon uh, Nduli, they've done serious work on this, uh, and they've shown that you, you agree that there's been a lot of useful effort by regional economic communities to integrate. Uh, but it seems that uh, that integration effort has only had a marginal effect on economic outcomes, for example, GDP growth and income and innovation. So, so, so that's, that's the problem. Why does it seem that the, all the efforts we've made towards regional integration is having only marginal impact. Well, one, one possible explanation could be that um, it is because th this regional integration efforts have not been accompanied by commensurate integration of infrastructure. And, and that's what we try to um, investigate in this, in this paper. So what is our aim? Well, there, there are three main things we aim to achieve here. The first is to assess the extent to which 
um, infrastructure integration can facilitate or can serve as a catalyst for income improvement in Africa for trade and for productivity growth. And then we, we try to identify the regions in Africa and so, you know, the regional economic communities where infrastructure is working more excellently than other regions. Uh, and the idea is so that they can, we can learn something from those regions. And, and thirdly, we try to use some um, normative, you know, using experience and anecdotal evidence to learn from other regions or from other places what, what works, you know, strategies that work for regional integration. So in the next few slides, we're going to be seeing both positive economics, which is based on, you know, facts, testable facts, and um, normative kind of economics, where we use experience and, and like doctoral evidence or subjective opinion to inform our. our <laughs> now, what we're going to learn at the end, I'm just giving you for this, is uh, we're going to, because we do disaggregation by infrastructure sectors, we're, we're going to learn, we're going to understand which of the different sectors of infrastructure that for can impact on economic outcomes. Is it ICT, is it trade, is it electricity, or, or water um, resources? Also, by benchmarking infrastructure according to regional economic blocks, um, we, are, we are able to identify where has infrastructure endowment. And um, so uh, that was a very useful at the AUC and the African Development Bank, and, and they came together and put up this document, this um, the Program for Infrastructure Development, PIDA. And this PIDA contains the we can do uh, at the neutral central level from the top to the bottom. But if we do a cursory, a cursory benchmarking of Africa's infrastructure in relation to uh, other parts of the world, then um, it may not be politically correct to say that Africa's infrastructure, the state of Africa's infrastructure endowment is, is abysmal. And um, I know that this chart may not be very easy to see, but I have highlighted two, two, two areas. You, the, this, these two highlighted rows show you how, how dead the, the situation is. Um, in terms of the situation is worse for electricity generation. You know, Africa, electricity generation per one million people in Africa is about half the next uh, the next region, which is South, South Asia, and about one tenth of the power generation in Europe. So there's, there's a lot of gap and there's a lot of um, catching up to do. Um, the situation is, however, not as severe for ICT uh, because you can see from here the density of mobile telephones per 100 persons is about 74, which is close to 84 in South Asia and, and other regions. But this, this statistics mask regional differences that you see in, for example, EAC or ECOWAS or in SADEC. And, and in the next chart, in the next table, we'll show um, some of these differences. You see, if you, if you look at this infrastructure endowment according to regional economic communities, you'll find that it, it appears that the East African community um, is, is, at, is behind in terms of infrastructure endowment. Um, but this, uh, and SADEC, SADEC is several multiples above other regions in infrastructure endowment. But um, in, in spite of, as for the other regions, we can't tell exactly, we, we can't rank them in terms of which ones are doing better in infrastructure. But we know for sure that SADEC has um, better integrated infrastructure than the other regions. Um, the East African community, however, ha has, done, has done better in terms of water and sanitation endowment. So, but, you know, it's not all doom doom. There's, there's good news. Um, the, the thing is that th there's evidence now that the, you know, the return on investment on infrastructure in Africa is, is about the highest in, in, in the whole world, compar comparatively. And there's a recent study at the, I, uh, at the AFDB that shows that most of the private sector firms that ventured into infrastructure, um, for example, in, in the ICT and energy, have returned significant, have, have re reported significant value addition in terms of balance sheet um, improvement. So, so now this this table you see. Um, at the estimated cost of bridging the infrastructure gap. And this is from PIDA, the Program for Infrastructure Development in Africa. So now, the, the, the three decades, the, the outlook from 2012 to 2014 um, has an estimated 360 billion US dollar financial 
a requirement to bridge the infrastructure gap in Africa. But I mean, that's an ambitious uh, amount to look for in a very short period. So there's a, there's a PAP, which is the Priority Action Plan. The, the, this PAP is like a 10, is, is a 10 year action program which tries to um, make this more practical. And what we've done is to say that, um, is to estimate the, the financial cost of bridging infrastructure gap at 67 billion USD. And, and this is the, the, the distribution by sector. So, so you see that energy and transport sector have about 95% um, of this cost. But as we're going to show later in the study, in, in the research we've done, uh, this ranking, this apportionment may not necessarily be the optimal if we, if we were to study this um, more correctly. But you see, by region, the, the most of the fraction goes to Central Africa and East Africa. Um, about one, one third of excuse me, two thirds of, of all of this budget goes to Central Africa and East Africa, which are relatively um, lagging behind in terms of infrastructure integration. So, so here's, here's, the, here's the map of the master plan for integrating infrastructure according to the program for infrastructure development in Africa. And you see, this, for, for the electricity, the, the idea is to integrate all, most of the hydropower projects into one, one pool so that um, you know, countries can draw from it. The transport network, the idea is to, is to connect the major consumption centers to the major uh, production centers and to link up uh, most, um, petroleum pipelines in, in the region. That's what you see this, um, this chart. Uh, this is the ICT network, which is mainly for fiber optic um, connections around the entire continent. And this is uh, the water connection network which deals more or less with multi-purpose type dams that you can use for irrigation and, and water systems. Okay, so, so we're asking this important question. I mean, if you have to justify a regional integration of infrastructure in Africa, you need to, we need to ask and, and answer this question, how, how much has infrastructure played its role in its catalytic role in Africa? And we try and you know, identify three different kinds of roles that um, infrastructure can play. Uh, the first one is what we call um, the role of infrastructure as a Keynesian catalyst. Uh, now, what this is really is the role that infrastructure expenditures play in terms of um, um, improving employment levels, in terms of driving growth and output. So the more money you spend to build, you improve people's incomes by spending more money. And, and so the multiply effect from spending money on building, infra on building and integrating infrastructure will be experienced at the downstream and um, upstream level. Now, typically, it's recommended that most countries should, uh, should budget about 6% of GDP and spend on infrastructure integration. But from, from the statistics, we see uh, that the, the average expenditure on infrastructure in Africa is around 3%. So there's not enough um, uh, infrastructure expenditure. That's what the data says. Now, what we've plotted here is a scatter plot of, of the infrastructure and it has four different components and it contains nine indicators and what you have here is GDP per capita. So we see indeed that um, more infrastructure, uh, greater levels of infrastructure is associated with higher levels of per capita income and you see some, some outliers here, South Africa, Sicilies and Mauritius. So indeed, uh, I mean if we were to interpret this literally, it means that infrastructure does help to um, improve income in, in Africa. So that's one justification if you're asking the question, why, why, why integrate infrastructure? Now, this is the relationship, this is the scatter of Africa Infrastructure Development Index and employment levels in population. And, and this chart is rather surprising because we would have thought that um, the higher the stocks of infrastructure, the infrastructure index, the higher should be the level of um, employment in population. But what we see here, I mean, at best could be a flat um, uh, line across, or, or, or even negative. So it, it seems that infrastructure improvements or development has, may not have necessarily brought about the kind of employment generation we are talking about. But this is this is only a, a literal interpretation because this is a scatter plot of the two. Now, so so we have established that infrastructure does help to improve income, and um, but we are not sure exactly what it does like, to employment levels. But we can think of infrastructure as its role, in its role as a as a Ricardian catalyst. Now, what this is is infrastructure's role um, in improving uh, in, in trade facilitation. 
in reducing the distribution margin. So the idea is that infrastructure can have um, a, a, virtue, a double virtue of sharpening terms of trade. So that because you have more, better integrated infrastructure, the cost of export falls. And then the cost of import at the same time falls. So, so with mo more infrastructure, there's more importation, and the, at the same time, there's more exports. And th there's better competitiveness, um, there's more participation by even small firms in the global market, in the regional market, if you like. Uh, I'll, in the next chart, I'm going to show you what the, what the data and statistics says about um, the role of infrastructure in trade facilitation. Now, here's a plot of um, Africa's infrastructure development index and, and trade, total trade in GDP. Uh, the relationship doesn't seem to be very strong after all. It seems that more infrastructure uh, is positive as we expect, but uh, uh, we're going to go back to proper causal analysis of this. So it, we're not sure exactly if more infrastructure has led to greater intra-regional trade in Africa. But we, we, can, we can be more sure here that um, better infrastructure endowments have reduced, uh, have led to trade facilitation, better trade facilitation. On, on this horizontal axis, we have the cost to export per container. So this is the cost of exporting, the average cost of exporting one container from a country. And this is the transport infrastructure composite. And we see that more infrastructure, the more infrastructure you have, uh, the more integrated infrastructure is, the lower is the cost to export one unit of um, container. So, so infrastructure integration does help to, to reduce distribution margin. Uh, so the, the last one we'll talk about is the role of infrastructure as a new classical catalyst. Uh, and this has to do with the infrastructure in, in an economy then um, by, by itself, it, it, it promotes um, productivity, innovation in, in an economy. And so this is, this is what the, uh, the statistics say. This is TFP growth. We got TFP growth from UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Uh, and so this is total factor productivity growth for African countries, and this is ICT infrastructure. And you see that countries with higher, uh, regions with higher levels of ICT have um, greater TFP growth level. Uh, and, and, and this too, so this tells us something about the role of infrastructure in spurring innovation in Africa. Uh, on this axis, you have the number of patent applications by African countries, and, and here we have ICT infrastructure composite. So you see, countries that have more infrastructure have many more patent applications. I mean, South Africa is there as an outlier, but you see the, the, this relationship is positive, that more, infra more ICT infrastructure um, um, you know, is associated with higher levels of, of patent applications from domestic countries. Okay, so, so we did some causal um, analysis, and, and I won't talk uh, too much about that, but I want to show you just one, one point I've highlighted. Now, these are the different sectors of infrastructure. And we did a simple regression on, on the GDP per capita and this infrastructure and some control variables which we have omitted. And, and what we find is that the, the ICT subsector uh, seems to have the strongest impact, multiply effect on, on outcome, on GDP per capita. So incomes with, with greater levels of um, ICT infrastructure, it seems that um, incomes improve the fastest uh, with more uh, and then the ranking is such that um, it's ICT and then transport, energy, and, and water um, last. So, so the next important question we ask is, where is infrastructure working best among the regional economic communities? Um, and um, what we do to achieve this, um, we want to unbundle, um, you know, the, the, the results we showed before is masking the differences in the regional economic communities. So we want to bundle these regional differences in impact uh, among the rest. Uh, what we did was to try and interact the infrastructure variable with the regional economic community dummies and, uh, and find, look for the marginal effect at different levels of infrastructure development. Uh, so, um, now, now this chart, uh, this chart, I'll tell you, this, this chart, what you see up here, are the, uh, this is aggregate infrastructure index, the African infrastructure index at different levels. And this, uh, the marginal impact for the different regional economic blocks. So, I mean, we can learn something from here. At infrastructure levels below 21, uh, you can see that the impact of infrastructure on economic improvement is, is relatively clustered. I mean, you can't, you can't see the differences too much. But as infrastructure starts to get um, 
more integrated and higher, then you, you see these differences. And, and what, what is particularly interesting is that the EAC seems to have, um, and, and EAC and SADEC, um, they have the strongest, you know, higher, higher than the regional average um, multiplier effect of infrastructure on the rest of the economy. Uh, and this um, would, would, would inform one of the recommendations you make. As for trade, the relationships are not very strong. Um, for uh, the, the relationship is, 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 is stronger for 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 CEMAC and um, for ECOWAS. And uh, for TFT, uh, we see that in in East, EAC has the strongest impact of infrastructure on on productivity growth. So so we like to go. To, uh, we like to talk about some of the some issues in Africa's infrastructure integration. And one of the main issues are the key challenges. We want to identify the key challenges in Africa's infrastructure integration. And one of the key challenges is the topographical differences, the geographical and topographical diversity, which implies that you know any infrastructure, you, you cannot use one kind of infrastructure for the entire region. I mean, there are eight different um, geographical regions in, in Africa, from the Sahel to the Savannah, to the Ethiopian high hills, to the uh, to, to the Swahili waterside. So the different kinds of roads, different kinds of infrastructure is required for. And, and this is the major challenge: how to integrate infrastructure across this kind of geographical uh, different areas. And, and and the next thing is how to do proper cost-benefit analysis. So you want to you want to build a road that cuts across the entire East Africa uh, community. What's the what's the cost-benefit analysis? Um, what's the distributional implication of the equity implications? Um, wh what are the impacts on the environment, on displacement, on migration, on communicable diseases and, and pollution? And so th this is one challenge that if we can have um, credible cost-benefit analysis, then those kind of acrimonies that come from uh, the distributional inequity that some countries seem to think that they suffer when they do um, cross-border projects will probably be sorted in this kind of environment. And, and this is why the role of neutral bodies like the African Development Bank and the, the African Union is very important because then they serve as an officiating body um, to, provide this, um, uh, to provide this unifying standard and you know, do this cost-benefit analysis to show um, where the gains and the costs should come from. Um, so, so another important question is how should infrastructure integration be advanced in Africa? Should it be market-led or institution-led? And, um, and I mean, uh, our, our, our team, we, we tend to favor a combination of the two approaches, both a market-led approach and an institutional-led approach. And I mean, you, you can't, you sh we shouldn't think of driving infrastructure integration completely by the market-led approach because um, the, the volumes of trade, intra-regional trade, um, although it's improving, but it's, the volumes are not high enough to drive uh, infrastructure integration through the market means. Uh, so if you, if you were to drive infrastructure by only allowing um, the flow of trade to drive this, then you, you probably have a slow and lackluster uh, infrastructure integration program. Uh, now, the next thing is that there's significant heterogeneity among countries uh, in, in Africa. Some of them are resource intensive countries, others are agricultural intensive countries, um, some, some uh, are both, some are mixed. So, so when are you going to have this coincidence, economic fundamentals that will coincide to, to make all of them invest in the same kind of uh, project? Some are, are looking at shipping lines to ship the oil to uh, the rest of the world, while others want to export in the region. So, uh, so, that's, so that's why we, we say that the market-led approach may not be the optimal approach. Rather, we recommend an, an institutional-based approach first. Uh, so the idea is uh, to pursue a top-down, government-led, and market um, creating approach uh, to infrastructure integration in Africa. So uh, now we are rethinking infrastructure integration, and there's this idea about inverse infrastructure. Uh, now, inverse infrastructure is, is like moving away from the, the old-fashioned traditional infrastructure provision where you know, the government or some big uh, utility company comes and provides all this infrastructure uh, that cuts across the entire region. In inverse infrastructure is going the other way around where you allow some mushroom-sized small firms, individuals and small companies to provide infrastructure, which eventually develops into a, a regional and even global infrastructure. Um, examples of this kind of 
social structure mechanism is, is um, the use of Wikipedia and uh, Google. Where you, so it's for policy to identify uh, the areas where we have where you have inverse infrastructure developing, just small mushroom size small um, networks, and then try to support these networks to build up to, to a bigger infrastructure, uh, which can now get integrated in the region. Okay, so, so this is one of our last slides. We want to talk about some methods that work. Um, um, so you can incentivization or by coordination, as we have been talking about here. Now, the, the U.S. is often presented as a typical example of a region that drives infrastructure integration through incentivization. Now, the idea is that the federal government comes and provides, at the macro level, um, some you know, um, incentives for the local municipalities and states to connect to infrastructure. For example, um, you can come at the macro level and, and, produce, and provide a road that, that just goes, uh, cuts across the entire country through the forest, for example. So it's left for the states and the local municipalities to connect to um, this macro level incentives. Uh, there could also be incentives from a financial point of view where you have this big fund at the AU or AFDB level and countries that are interested to, to pursue projects um, of infrastructure integration projects can access uh, with some incentives or have some technical support or administrative support. So, so incentivization may not have been the approach that Africa is using, but it has been shown to to work elsewhere, and it's something that um, we sh that should be thought about how to provide a macro level type, you know, framework that motivates uh, n nations and states to connect to the global infrastructure. And, and with this one, uh, you know, th there needs to be perhaps an African Public Utility Commission um, that will have the role of um, uh, providing regulatory and social oversight functions, so that, so that you protect against consumer. Uh, manipulation and unhealthy monopolistic competition. Now, the, the next approach, which is more common uh, that Africa has been using, is the coordination method. Uh, and this, uh, and, and I mean, this is like what the the EU, EU region is. And this, I mean, usually you see that Germany has integrated most of its infrastructure to the rest of Europe using this coordination method. Uh, and what this coordination does is that you have vertical and horizontal interactions between local uh, state level and national government. Uh, and so with this kind of uh, interactions and consensus building, a, a master plan for infrastructure integration uh, is provided. And that's what PIDA is, the Program for Infrastructure uh, Development in Africa. Those charts we showed you where, where, where you know, they came out of uh, coordination and, and consultation from national and um, pan-African institutions. So, so in conclusion, there are, there are three key takeaways from from the study that we present. The, the first one is that our, our findings tell us something about the different sectors of infrastructure and which ones um, are more important. So we see that the ICT, ICT sector, ICT infrastructure seems to have the strongest impact on economic outcomes. So if we're, if we're to um, interpret that literally, we'll recommend that infrastructure integration projects in Africa should be prioritized in this order. So, so the ICT infrastructure should have the strongest priority these days and followed by transport infrastructure, electricity infrastructure, and then water infrastructure. And I, I'm glad that the president of the Summer Institution was here and he was talking very seriously about how that uh, robotics, I mean, um, the artificial intelligence will, will soon take over farming, even farming. So, so ICT um, seems to be key uh, area that infrastructure integration needs to, needs to happen. Now, secondly, we find that SADEC, I mean, infrastructure integration seems to be working best in the Southern African Development Commission. And so th this is like an example that other regional, so we can find out what, what is it they're doing differently that, um, that is making infrastructure integration work stronger or better in that region. And this can be uh, something for other regions to perhaps um, emulate or learn. And one way to rethink infrastructure integration is to, is to switch from um, the old fashioned traditional top or bottom approach where the government or a big um, utility company provides infrastructure and gets it to move across to this mushroom size and uh, inverse infrastructure where you allow infrastructure to develop at, um, at the individual small levels and then from there they, they go up to the regional and even the global level. I'd like to thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, I think we have to clap very big clap for our young men who are presenting their very much.
we come to one of our giants also, Mr. Boyan Ob Homic Board, who is former Deputy Managing Director of Economic Affairs in the Ministry of Economic and Finance in Benin. So you are most welcome to come in. Thank you. Merci, uh, Monsieur le Ministre, uh, Monsieur, Monsieur le Président. Je remercie Dr. Choukou pour sa présentation uh, qui a, ma foi, essayé d'apporter le, le lubrifiant pour les mécanismes de l'intégration régionale. C'est sûr qu'on aura besoin encore de beaucoup d'autres lubrifiants pour euh, faire unir la machine. Alors, <coughs> le docteur Choukouchoukou a axé sa présentation essentiellement sur euh, euh, quatre ou cinq domaines. Mais les points importants qu'il a essayé de, de rappeler, et comme vous le savez, il a rappelé le rôle important de, de, des infrastructures dans l'intégration régionale nécessaire à la réalisation des grands objectifs euh, de l'Afrique, nécessaire à la transformation économique et à la création de la richesse. Il a ensuite euh, souligné le fait que malgré les progrès réalisés dans, dans certaines régions en matière d'intégration économique, financière, monétaire, il semble que les efforts et progrès ne semblent n'avoir qu'un impact marginal hein, sur la promotion de l'intégration régionale, le commerce et la croissance. Il souligne que probablement l'une des explications de cet impact marginal pourrait être le fait que les progrès n'ont pas été accompagnés des efforts proportionnels pour intégrer les infrastructures physiques. Il a dans un deuxième temps fait le diagnostic et euh, évoqué les perspectives notamment des trois prochaines décennies en matière de dotation en infrastructures. Une question essentielle à laquelle euh, il a essayé de répondre, c'est le rôle joué le rôle fonctionnel joué par l'infrastructure en Afrique. Est-ce que l'infrastructure a joué un rôle fonctionnel en Afrique dans, dans son exposé, il a quand même trouvé trois rôles. Un rôle en matière de revenus et de l'emploi, le rôle en matière de facilitation du commerce et, et en troisième point, le rôle dans la productivité et l'innovation. défis, quelques problèmes sont liés à, à l'intégration par les infrastructures en Afrique. Il a cité pêle-mêle les, les, les défis. Hein. Et il a par exemple rappelé les conflits endogènes qui ont besoin d'être résolus pour réussir l'intégration par l'infrastructure. Entre autres, la question, l'une des questions importantes pour les décideurs sur l'intégration régionale est de savoir comment l'intégration des infrastructures devrait être menée. Faut-il la mener selon l'approche axée sur le marché ou l'approche dirigée par les institutions L'étude de Dr. Chipouchou suggère les deux approches, la combinaison des deux approches. Bien évidemment, l'analyse empirique euh, au point 5 a essayé de... De, de conclure à, à partir des résultats de l'analyse que dans les secteurs de, des infrastructures, c'est le secteur des TIC qui a l'effet multiplicateur le plus élevé et qu'il faudra désormais accorder beaucoup plus d'attention à ce secteur. Bien évidemment, dans son classement, il y a les TIC, il y a les transports, il y a l'électricité et enfin l'eau. Bien sûr, l'intégration par les infrastructures devrait être selon ce classement, mais il y a des communautés régionales euh, qui ont connu, comparativement à d'autres, plus de succès et le, la SADEC a été citée. Donc voilà, en gros, euh, euh, pour aller vite, euh, un peu le, le condensé de, de, de la présentation de Dr Choukou Choukou. Maintenant, 
il y a quand même des sujets qui préoccupent et pour lesquels nous devrons poursuivre la réflexion. Il est clair hein, que, à partir de la littérature et tout ce que nous avons dit depuis ce matin, qu'aucun pays ne peut se dé développer sans accès à des infrastructures, à des infrastructures qui fonctionnent correctement. Hmm? Le développement des infrastructures est donc indispensable. Et les défis qu'on devrait euh, attaquer de, devraient nous amener vraiment à, à réfléchir pour lever les boulots d'étranglement. Entre autres, euh, le présentateur a cité la diversité géographique et topologique, voyez-vous, les différences significatives dans les types et spécifications appropriées. Mais à côté de ces différences de conditions initiales, euh, il est peut-être important d'insister sur la coordination, il l'a fait, la coordination et une consultation efficace entre les différentes parties prenantes. L'accent, me semble-t-il, n'est pas suffisamment mis sur les problématiques essentielles, les barrières naturelles et humaines, qui constituent aussi des obstacles à une meilleure intégration régionale et qui se, et qui se réfère au fait que l'Afrique est subdivisée en plusieurs espaces économiques, comprenant de nombreux pays, nous le disons, dépourvus de littoral ou figurant parmi ce que nous appelons les PMA. Alors, ces, ces pays sont en outre dispersés dans des organisations régionales et sous-régionales. Problème, problème de coordination et d'efficacité dans les interventions. Alors, il existe aussi un grand nombre de, de, de contraintes, notamment le manque d'harmonisation des politiques. Le manque d'harmonisation des politiques régionales le manque d'harmonisation des réglementations et des procédures. Euh, nous pouvons avancer, entre autres contraintes, les, en termes d'efficacité des capacités institutionnelles, administratives et financières de gouvernance, n'est-ce pas, à mener à bien les euh, projets de l'intégration d'infrastructures. En revenant au thème même de notre session, L'infrastructure a été subdivisée euh, en, en quatre composants. Le, le présentateur nous l'a subdivisé en, en, euh, en, en quatre composantes. Et pour le présentateur, on a classé, par exemple, dans les infrastructures, les NTIC, en premier lieu, les transports, l'énergie et l'eau. Mais il aurait été intéressant de voir comment chacune de ces composantes-là constitue un catalyseur pour le commerce, par exemple, pour l'innovation et pour la croissance, pour le développement, pour faire court. Parce que nous parlons d'intégration, mais au bout, c'est le développement. Alors, il est vrai, euh, déjà dès le départ, le présentateur a limité, hein, il a parlé, il, nous, il a souhaité parler de l'infrastructure en général. Alors, la question, c'est... Comment l'Afrique peut exploiter le potentiel des infrastructures transfrontalières pour éliminer les goulots d'étranglement Les infrastructures transfrontalières nous a donné des exemples, mais euh, au niveau de l'exécution de la mise en œuvre, ce n'est pas toujours euh, aisé. Hein? Nous, avons, nous avons dit, nous avons des, euh, des, des, des pays qui n'ont pas euh, accès au littoral, donc euh, il y a des problèmes de... Euh, de facilitation des échanges des biens et services. Alors, les ITF, une réponse efficace à certains obstacles majeurs qui entravent le développement et l'intégration, les corridors régionaux de transport en termes de création d'emplois offrent quand même un potentiel. Il faut aussi, en s'attaquant, bien évidemment, euh, nous avons déjà parlé, je n'insiste pas là-dessus, des problèmes liés au chevauchement des, des CER qui auraient permis euh, de, de contribuer à planer les difficultés euh, d'intégration régionale. Mais quand nous parlons d'infrastructures, de, euh, un des problèmes essentiels en Afrique, c'est la modernisation de l'existant, c'est l'entretien des infrastructures régionales 
existence. Ce n'est pas toujours notre fort. Et il va falloir euh, souligner ces questions-là, mettre la, le doigt sur là où euh, ça fait mal. Les engagements régionaux ont besoin d'être harmonisés, je l'ai dit tantôt, hein, que ce soit euh, dans le cadre des accords bilatéraux ou multilatéraux, mais également, il ne faut pas oublier, moi je viens d'un pays de la CDAO, euh, que nous sommes en train de vouloir faire avancer l'intégration dans des contextes qui n'était pas celui des années de création de certaines organisations, par exemple. En, en 1975, quand la CDAO naissait, on ne parlait pas de problèmes de... Euh, on ne parlait pas autant de problèmes de sécurité. Aujourd'hui, il va falloir promouvoir l'intégration dans un contexte de lutte pour, contre, euh, pour la sécurité régionale, de lutte contre des, euh, des, des groupes terroristes, de déstabilisation, etc. Et les agendas sécuritaires viennent parfois s'imposer aux agendas des travaux des organismes euh, d'intégration régionale. Moi, je parle beaucoup plus de la CDAO. Euh, un aspect est que certains pays sont développés euh, que, plus que d'autres et l'intégration suppose alors une certaine, euh, un certain partage de valeurs de solidarité. Hein, on a l'habitude de clamer la fraternité. Alors, l'intégration suppose la coopération mais une coopération basée sur des résultats, basée sur le gagnant-gagnant. Euh, un autre aspect, c'est que l'intégration euh, est également euh, dans, des, dans des contextes aujourd'hui où beaucoup d'énergie sont consacrées à régler des problèmes endogènes de gouvernance. Hein? Des situations conflictuelles au lendemain ou à l'approche des échéances électorales où il faut encore... Euh, euh, et régler des grèves à n'en pas finir qui, 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 qui diplôme euh, euh, l'évolution économique et bien évidemment fait appel à des médiations. Donc voilà des contextes qui ne sont pas toujours propices à l'intégration. J'aime bien souligner, euh, j'aime bien le, sans minimiser l'éthique, hein, mais il me semble important d'insister sur le transport. Que ce soit hein, euh, le, le PIDA ou que ce soit euh, les objectifs, d'ailleurs les objectifs des euh, les ODD, le transport joue un rôle central. Sur les 17, 7 parlent des cibles qui concernent spécifiquement le transport, le transport urbain, le transport urbain. Donc, il va falloir, euh, ma, ma foi, que le développement de, des infrastructures soit beaucoup plus euh, euh, de transport. J'entends je, je, hein, euh, l'accent soit un peu plus mis pour qu'on aille plus vers euh, des lendemains meilleurs. Les statistiques, on les connaît, le docteur Choukou, Choukou, Choukou les a citées dans, dans, dans son travail. Hein, Voyez-vous, le, le, je prends tout simplement le système ferroviaire africain. On en parle, on en reparle, mais ça fait déjà très longtemps, quand vous venez dans la zone, euh, juste notre zone, la zone CDAO, hein, euh, ça fait déjà très longtemps qu'on voulait relier, mais on n'a jamais pu le faire. Donc, euh, euh, le contexte également, c'est ce qui, euh, avec le, la Commission de l'Union africaine, on a signé un accord de grande portée qui s'inscrit dans le cadre de l'agenda 2063. Hein, une vision de relier toutes les capitales africaines par un système de routes, de trains à grande vitesse. C'est très beau, mais il faut y arriver, n'est-ce pas donc, ce qui devrait, et ça j'insiste dessus, de favoriser le commerce intra-africain, qui est très faible. Et, euh, qu'est-ce que j'ajoute Il faut améliorer les, les réseaux existants. Alors, comme pour le développement des infrastructures, il y a quand même euh, d'autres questions. Le présentateur nous a situé le, les infrastructures en infrastructures euh, euh, techniques et non techniques, infrastructures euh, physiques euh, et, et institutionnelles. Mais il va falloir, et nous n'avons pas le choix, mener de front ces les infrastructures là hein, et l'inefficacité des stratégies de développement du commerce des transports, des infrastructures. Le manque de cohérence sont souvent le résultat d'une approche fragmentée. On en a parlé déjà un peu ce matin. Cette approche aussi 
fragmenté au coup par coup en matière d'élaboration de politique ne, ne permet pas vraiment d'avancer comme on l'aurait voulu. Il faut relever donc ces défis et le relever des défis exige un effort concerté dès la création d'un environnement propice aux investissements dans des infrastructures frontalières, la coordination efficace avec un large éventail de parties prenantes, que ce soit les gouvernements, le secteur privé et aujourd'hui tous les acteurs majeurs qui, qui arrivent, et la priorisation des, des, des projets vraiment viables. Une harmonisation, une normalisation des cadres, c'est important, une répartition des coûts et avantages entre les pays participants. Euh, voilà, on pourrait dire que le, le niveau des, réal, des investissements nécessaires à la réalisation des projets d'infrastructures régionales de grande envergure dépasse bien évidemment les capacités hein, des pays. Et il faut nécessairement voir la question du financement euh, de, de ces infrastructures et le rôle des PPP. Je vous remercie, M. le Président. Thank you very much. Again, I think we give him a loud, louder applause. <laughs> In fact, it is now your turn to ask questions, and I need direct questions, either to the presenter or the discussion. And if there are some few comments, it will be very few. But in fact, uh, the presenter, I think, was trying to tell you that infrastructure can play a significant role in promoting regional integration with it more rapid and sustained growth in Africa. And if he gave you the aims of this integration, and also he took up some key challenges which he mentioned, at the same time the approaches to make in order to make these things successful, and as well he ended up by giving you key issues for you to take away. So we need as a discussion of this based on what he said and what uh, the discussion said. We put them together with what come from you and I would advise the secretary to take points seriously so that these things will become our recommendations later on in whatever we see when we put all these things together. Now I will give chances to you. I will start from here, and then go here, and then go there. I'll take, first of all, two from here, two from here, two from here, then I come back again in rotation. Yes, yeah. You mention your name, you, where you come from, and then key specific. Thank you, uh, uh, Director of Ceremony. Uh, my name is Joel Sinsu. I come from Botswana. Uh, I'm Economic Advisor in the Ministry of Investment, Trade and Industry. Um, let me take this opportunity, Chair, to thank the presenters. Um, I, I was happy to see uh, uh, the Dr. Chukuchuku. I, some years ago, in 1992, I was at Manchester and I'm glad to see a graduate from Manchester. Thank you very much. Um, I just have one observation that I want to make about uh, the issue of infrastructure, infrastructure uh, that is a key uh, to regional integration, and I totally agree with that uh, assertion. I wanted to just point out that I think the key of infrastructure, I mean, the issue of infrastructure should be um, attached or connected to uh, the development of regional value chains. Um, as we mentioned this in the morning, the discussions we had in the morning, I think uh, if we develop uh, industries, especially developing industries where uh, uh, there's mutual uh, benef benefit for the member states, uh, what, what would be helpful would be to uh, uh, develop the, the regional value chain and see where member states 
can enter within that uh, regional value chain. Uh, in, in our region there, in, in, the, in the Saku area, uh, we know there is, in South Africa, they are more developed in the automotive industry. Uh, in countries like uh, Botswana and Namibia, uh, we have leather. And uh, in, in terms of the development of uh, a regional value chain uh, in the automotive, is that if we develop the, the whole value chain for uh, automotive development, then uh, the, the countries uh, such as Botswana and Namibia uh, with uh, leather, then they can uh, contribute or yeah, enter the, the value chain uh, by providing leather. And I think uh, this discussion uh, on, 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 on the development of infrastructure would fit in the issue of regional value chain. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Again, yeah, near you. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, un commentaire et deux questions, rapidement. Il uh, y a une expression en français qui dit « quand la route passe, le développement suit ». On pourrait dire « quand les infrastructures passent, l'intégration économique suit ». Et donc, euh, j'associe ma voix aux remerciements et aux félicitations euh, adressées aux, aux présentateurs et aux discutants. Euh, au niveau des résultats, euh, on, peut, on peut noter que le meilleur élève, c'est la SADEC, qui a réalisé les meilleures performances en termes de relations entre intégration régionale et infrastructure. Ma question est la suivante. Si dans la SADEC, nous, nous enlevons l'Afrique du Sud, est-ce que le résultat serait tout à fait défendable Parce que l'Afrique du Sud, on peut dire que c'est un pays à revenu intermédiaire, pour ne pas dire euh, un pays déjà industrialisé par rapport à l'ensemble des autres pays de la SADEC. Ça, c'est la première question. Euh, la deuxième préoccupation, c'est euh, par rapport aux recommandations. Je crois que, euh, si j'ai bien compris, il y a deux voies. Il y a ce que vous avez appelé l'approche inverse, entre guillemets, euh, qui voudrait qu'on passe des micro-projets vers euh, une euh, intégration plus grande, et puis l'approche traditionnelle qui passe des macro-projets, si on peut dire. Euh, la question, c'est que euh, on aurait souhaité, en tout cas moi j'aurais souhaité, que vous fassiez la part entre le type d'infrastructure qui répond à chaque type. Parce que si nous prenons, et le discutant a parlé des, des rails par exemple, ou du rail, euh, ce n'est qu'un macro-projet, n'est-ce pas Et euh, ce serait bon que, peut-être dans les réponses, vous puissiez nous dire, dans les types d'infrastructures, effectivement, euh, au niveau de l'énergie, euh, les pays du Sahel, ils ont du soleil. On ne va pas construire un barrage euh, en RDC pour aller les, les alimenter. Vous comprenez, n'est-ce pas Mais il euh, y a deux types d'infrastructures qui ne peuvent pas euh, répondre à cette euh, classification régionale ou à cette typologie-là. Euh, la troisième préoccupation, c'est le financement. Et le discutant avait fini un peu par là. Il a dit PPP, je crois que tout le monde a compris, que c'est partenariat public-privé. Et donc, il faut peut-être nous dire, euh, là où le bas blesse, ou là où il y a la vraie difficulté, c'est de trouver des ressources pour financer nos projets d'infrastructure. Euh, est-ce que, quelles sont les possibilités aujourd'hui euh, offertes par le partenariat public-privé premier, premier aspect, il y a quelques années, je crois que ça existe encore, euh, le partenariat pour le développement de l'Afrique qui devait être basé en Afrique du Sud au sein de l'Union africaine, n'est-ce pas euh, Comment vous avez appelé ça déjà Le NEPAD. Le NEPAD, voilà. Euh, je crois que le cheval de bataille ou l'objectif principal du NEPA, c'était de développer les infrastructures. Où est-ce que nous en sommes Et euh, peut-être qu'il faut nous informer et voir si par rapport à l'objectif de développement des infrastructures, 
le LEPAD reste encore utile ou de, comment on peut le dynamiser Merci. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I think I would like to repeat myself again that we don't want too much lecture. We need direct questions so that we give opportunity to so many If you have a question to the presenter, direct it to the presenter. If you have a question to the discussion, direct it to him or to any of them, actually. So this side, yeah? Thank you, Honorable Chair. My name is Donald Imari from Repoa, Tanzania. I have two uh, contributions to make. Uh, one actually in form of a question directed to Dr. Chukshuku. Uh, and one is this uh, issue of infrastructure, and particularly on uh, transport infrastructure mix, uh, because you already say that, the, that there's a significant variation in geography, of course, and the cost for building inf transport infrastructure. Then it's perhaps high time we begin to think about the aviation industry as, 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 an, as an alternative uh, mean to fast track movement of people and goods, uh, light cargo, perishables, and food, and not to treat uh, air transport as a luxury. Within Africa, of course, uh, it's extremely expensive. It takes much longer time. Uh, perhaps uh, Professor Chris Adam from Oxford fl flew here in a much shorter time than most of us uh, from the neighboring countries. So I think this is a serious problem that we, th we need to think as a, as a strategic investment while we continue to, to build on uh, railways and roads connecting each other. I would like to hear uh, your views on this. Uh, the second point, uh, I think also directed to you, has to do with uh, trust, which is quite important among African countries if we are to integrate. Uh, and, and now we can begin to leverage on the ICT, for example. Uh, and uh, one case in point uh, is uh, the movement of people in particular is, is very restricted still, despite the fact that some of the countries have started to move uh, visa requirements. Uh, I once uh, was traveling to uh, Dakar, Senegal, I think a few years ago, and I asked them if I could get a visa on arrival. They said, no, go to the French embassy to get, get the visa. So I'm an African, going to an African country, I have to get my visa from a European country. I think these kinds of uh, barriers have to be addressed using uh, ICT, for example, to thanks. Thank you, Chair. Mine is a, a question to Dr. Shoku and then a comment. And uh, I would start, uh, uh, my name is Luol Deng uh, from Ebony Center, South Sudan. Uh, financial infrastructure, I think it should be part of the infrastructure, especially the, uh, the banking sector across the continent. But my comment is the when I look at the way we're thinking, point is, is, is not just for, for the current panelists, uh, Professor Lima and his team, whereby it really assume that Africa as a, as a, a country, not a continent. And if you assume that way, then you, you think in terms of like China or India, and then you can plan the, the infrastructure uh, accordingly. And this is whereby the, the telecom comes in not just ITC, but even telecom where the telephone system has to be harmonized. And with my colleague from Tanzania, that also the question of air transport, even the airline, these national airlines, they could be put pulled into fewer one and then ask countries to have equity in those airlines instead of every country try to get its own uh, airline. The, the other is the, especially the power also, where it could be uh, transported. So I think this is an area where we also need to, to look at it uh, critically. But also for the researchers, I think the, maybe it is time for you to think, in t if we assume that Africa is a continent, 
then we now think in terms of uh, meso, um, macro, meso, and micro. And we see how this infrastructure cut across those three levels. Thank you. Thank you. At that side, and I would like to prepare a woman now. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ms. Honorable Minister. Uh, I have two questions, one to Dr. Chuku and one to the discussion. So for Dr. Chuku, when, you, when I look at the definition of the transport composite, it only captures roads, as others have commented. And when you look forward into the new technologies like drones and so on, which do not need this sort of physical infrastructure, how would you, in your analysis, adjust for these non-hardwired infrastructures, whether it's wireless electricity or drone technology for uh, transport uh, solutions? And then for the discussions, um, you mentioned the very uh, important opportunities for public-private partnerships. The ICT sector was driven by the private sector. Do you see any opportunities, particularly in water and electricity, where the lessons learned could be adaptable uh, to bring in more private investment for those sectors? Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Tumisan Svanda and I'm from the Zimbabwe National Chamber of Commerce. Uh, mine is just a comment. I know the presenter indicated that uh, the private sector has been uh, involved in the IT uh, sector when it comes to infrastructure development. But I think uh, there is still need for more regular consultations with the private sector. Uh, this will give uh, more space for the private sector to play a role in the integration process and uh, this will also boost the productive capacity. Then I also wanted to ask um, the presenter on the, when it comes to infrastructure development, the role of women, youth, and uh, SMEs. I think that's an important aspect which needs to be considered as well. Uh, that, that, that role, again, will have opportunity if there is a woman who likes a lady. It's a if up. there is no lady, My then name. I come here. This side, any question? Yes, the last one. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Honourable Minister. My name is Karabo Marita. I come from Lesotho. And I would like to apologize for uh, the absence of my uh, Honourable Minister, Minister Aumani, from the Ministry of Development Planning. I was supposed to, be, to have landed yesterday, but uh, due to other commitments, I was not able to make it. Uh, mine is basically um, just a comment uh, on the infrastructure. In SADC, uh, we have uh, in transport a uh, protocol on transport, uh, communications and meteorology, and there are standards uh, which have been set you know, in order that we have harmonization. But ever since uh, the protocol was signed in 1996, implementation has been very slow or minimal. So I think we also have to look into standards as well as harmonization and implementation, not just providing uh, infrastructure. Are we able to harmonize within our own economic blocks? If we are then, or if we are not able to do that, how then can we do it within, uh, across the other economic blocks, for instance, Comesa, EAC, and SADAC, and others. So we, I think we should take into consideration the, uh, the issue of harmonization. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody again, that this side? Then I go to this side, yeah? You, yeah? Cyril Onabode, Institut Universitaire Pan-Africain, Bénin. Euh, Puisqu'il a parlé des infrastructures, notamment, je veux aborder les transports et les rôles des corridors régionaux que nous avons, surtout qu'il est aussi du Nigeria. Nous avons, le corridor est 
Abidjan, Lagos, Cotonou. Et par exemple, l'impact en termes régionaux. Est-ce que vous avez regardé ces aspects Merci. Thank you. Uh, my name is Waliangandu from Zambia. <coughs> I need a clarification from the Dr. Chuku. I had uh, a certain amount of difficulty accepting your, the link you drew between infrastructure development and the cost of exports. What I saw, the graph I saw on the screen, for me was evidence that landlocked countries have higher export costs than those countries which are linked, which are directly by the sea. Uh, which is why if you looked at the graph, you saw countries like Zambia, um, Zimbabwe, Swaziland, the ones that are landlocked having higher costs than those that are by the sea. And that makes sense because if you look at the, the cost of uh, inland transport in Africa, you find that it's extremely high. Take for example, uh, moving um, a container from Japan to Dar es Salaam is probably three times less than moving the same container from Dar es Salaam to Tapirim Posh in central Zambia, just as an example. So for me, what you are showing wasn't, besides that, you also have roadblocks on the way, which we talked about, and uh, you have to pay uh, the policemen that you meet along the way. Uh, there are delays at the borders. When you compound all these, you find uh, extremely high costs um, in the form of inland uh, 